Welcome to Martha Runs the World, a podcast with a new take on running, fitness, and all things health-oriented. I'm Martha Hughes, your host, and each week I present a new topic that is of interest to all runners. Hi, and welcome to episode 246 of Martha Runs the World. How are you doing today? I'm doing fabulous. Let me tell you, I had the most amazing run after work this weekend. Yeah, I had to work this weekend. Every other weekend I work, but I still want to get my runs in. So I went out after work, got home, changed real quick, went out before the sunset and got almost five miles, 4.6 miles. And it was so much fun. I ran almost the whole time, really pushed myself. It was just a fun, fun run. And I, I just had a good time really a good run. I can really tell my progress is getting better. My running is getting better. It's just such improvement. I'm getting a little nervous for my half that I have in November, but I think, I think I'll be fine. I just want to make the cutoffs. (laughs) It's really a a practice run for my bigger runs after that, but I still want to do okay. Well, I have a great guest today. My guest today is Bill Viggers. He wrote the book, Terry and Me, that just was released. Bill will tell us his story of how he met Terry. And we're talking about Terry Fox. If you've listened to my podcast before, you know that I am a huge fan of the hero, the Canadian hero, Terry Fox. Terry Fox is Canada's greatest hero. And if you've listened to the show, you do know that I did an episode completely about Terry. Um, and you can go back and listen to it. I'll have the the notes all on the website, MarthaRunsTheWorld.com, so you can check out that episode. But if you have never listened to the podcast before, you can go back and listen to it. But yeah, so I've done a whole episode on Terry Fox. And this is will be great addition to this. This book is really terrific. Bill did a great job on it, and he brought a lot of pers- his personal experience with Terry and a lot more personal stories and anecdotes during his being with Terry in the Marathon of Hope. You will really enjoy hearing from him. I had a great time interviewing him. He's a wonderful gentleman and a great writer. And here is Bill Viggers. Will you welcome to the program? This is Bill Viggers. He just wrote the book, Terry and Me. It's the one with Terry's picture right on the front. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. It's a little early here still. Actually, it's re- just was released yesterday as as of this recording. He is also a publicist, and he did he has a nice, wonderful history with Terry. And we're going to talk about uh, all of that today. So, uh, tell me, tell us how you met first met Terry. I had been a volunteer with the Canadian Cancer Society, um, and I was thirty three at the time, and I had just actually been hired by the Ontario Division, which is like a state division of the Cancer Society, to do fundraising and public relations. And about two months into the job, um, my boss comes to me and said, there's a there's a young man with one leg going to run across Canada. Do you want to see what you can go and do for him? And that was basically my introduction. It was a, it was a two sentence letter. And um, I started talking to Terry when he was in eastern Canada. And you you have to remember, this is 1980. There is no cell phones. There is no Internet. Uh, so he would call from a payphone. And uh, that summer, basically, that's how we communicated from, a pay, from phone booths. I met him first. Uh, I went to meet him out on the East Coast. And I arrived. Um, I knew I had talked to him before. Uh, on the phone several times. And when I first talked to him, he was down and not much was happening. Um, He had not gotten much press and he had not raised a lot of money. Although in one community in Newfoundland, 
and it was the last one before he got on the ferry to come to the mainland. It was a, a town, of, it's called Porta Basque. And of course, Newfoundlanders are known for their generosity and kindness. And that town of 8,000 raised $8,000. So Terry gets an idea that he wants to raise a dollar for every Canadian. And again, 42 years ago, the population of Canada was 24 million. And he set his goal. And for some reason, I didn't think it was that hard to reach, particularly after I met him. And that first meeting in, in, in he got up every morning at four o'clock. He started running at five. By eight o'clock, he would run 12 miles, four miles an hour, a 10 pound prosthesis, uh, not even remotely what uh, amputees are running with today. Uh, he'd have breakfast, and it was massive breakfast, carbs, lots of carbs. And he'd have a, about a two-hour nap. He'd get up, and he'd run an, another eight miles. Um, and then he'd have a short rest, sometimes a nap even. And then he'd get up, and he'd run until about four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And for 143 days in a row, except for two, which I made him take off uh, to stay to a schedule, he ran a marathon a day. Um, and I'm 76 and I still work in miles and I think the U S works in miles. So 26 miles every single day for 142 days, 143 days, how he did it. I don't know how. I mm, that is really amazing. <laughs> if you think about it and, and the prosthesis this was 10 pounds, you say? Yes. Wow. It was, it was made out of uh, fiberglass um, he worked with a, um, a gentleman in his hometown, which is out on the West Coast, Vancouver. Actually, he was in a small town called Port Coquitlam. And they, for lack of a better phrase, tested on different things. It worked, how it worked was it had two, two piston springs at the back where the knee joint was. And when he uh, took he'd have to he had this unusual gait and if you ever have a chance to watch a video um by the way steve nash the nba all-star made a documentary a few years ago called into the wind and it's the best documentary made on terry please watch it anyway he had to develop this gate where he'd have to put a skip in between each step and when he took the weight off the artificial leg the spring would cause the leg to snap back and then with his stump, he would have to kick it back out again, step on it again like a pogo stick, um, come through with his good leg. And that, you know, day after day, mile after mile. And when they were first designing it, they actually tried to use uh, pogo uh, springs out of pogo sticks, which didn't work. And I forget what they actually ended up using. And then Terry sort of. Uh, gerrymander in it with a strap around his waist that went down the front of the artificial leg that helped snap it back up. But it was not only is he running all day, but he has that arduous job of kicking that artificial leg back out so he can run. I can't imagine how painful that must have been. He said um, often that, you know, for the first four or five miles every day, it was extremely painful. And then just psychologically, like runners do, he got over that. And when people, he was a very sincere young man. He was only 22 when he did the run. And nobody wrote, and I, I think I want to say this right up front so the listener can understand. He was, nobody wrote speeches for Terry Fox. There was no entourage. He traveled with his brother and his best friend in an Ford Econovan. That until I arrived, they slept in, ate in, cooked in. Uh, it smelled bad. <laughs> so it was a very unsophisticated uh, journey. And it never changed right to the very end when he got sick. But um, every day he, he would go through that. And he'd, people would say, doesn't that hurt? And he said, yeah, it hurts a lot. And he said, but when he was diagnosed with cancer and art art uh, osteosarcoma and it was in his knee and within 24 hours they amputated his knee he was 17 he was always uh, an athlete when he was a kid um, 
you know, a basketball player that the coach said, you'll never make the team, but he would practice and practice and practice in his driveway and he would work with his friend, Doug. And by the time grade eight came along, he was the starter. He, he went to Simon Fraser University. Same thing. Kid take up wrestling. Um, he practiced, practiced, practiced. And he was a starter uh, on, the, on the basketball team. And then he lost his leg, but he never lost his drive for sports or being the best that you can. Yeah, I'm j I just want to, he would say, does it hurt? He said, yes, it does. But it doesn't hurt like the people with cancer. He was treated in a children's ward. He saw young people much younger than him with cancer fight it. Many of them passed away. And that never left him. And that's what motivated him every day. And he said, I can quit anytime I want, but the people in the cancer wards, they cannot quit. That certainly changes a person when you get so sick, so young. It just just set his mindset for the rest of his young life. In the book, uh, the nurse who was his nurse, there was two nurses that were very helpful for me when in writing the book. One was the one that treated him when he was first diagnosed, when he went through the amputation. And the second one was the one that dealt with him when the cancer returned and basically saw him over nine months out of this world. They were both wonderful they're, and they're lovely human beings. But um, the first one uh, gave me a letter that Terry had written her in January of 1980. And he talked about how his time in the hospital completely changed him. He said, I used to be very self-centered. I was only interested in sports and me. And he said, getting cancer, believe it or not, in this letter, he says, getting cancer was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And he even says, how many people have ever said, I didn't want to leave the hospital because he was enjoyed working. They said when he got diagnosed, amputated his leg, he then became almost like a nurse to all the young kids in the ward. Um, he had a lot of time. He really connected with young people. That is pretty incredible to, to be adult enough to, to know that something that severe ch has changed your mindset at, a, at such a young age that, that he, he showed so much maturity, I think. I I have to tell them one story, and, and um, he thought he had hurt his leg in a car accident, and it didn't get better, kept on getting worse, went and had it diagnosed, and within four hours, the doctor's saying, I got to amputate your leg, which was devastating for an 18-year-old, uh, who his entire life was sports, and the night before his amputation, his uh, high school coach came in with a runner's magazine, and it was a story about Dr. Dick Trom, and he was an amputee who had run the New York Marathon in 1978, I believe, and he's still around, and he was an inspiration to Terry, and Terry was an inspiration to him. I stayed in touch with him over the years, but... Terry's reaction was he read that article and his act words of if that old fart can run a marathon, I can too. And he said he dreamed that night about running across Canada. So, uh, which sounds bizarre, almost unbelievable. And that dream stuck with him. And he told his mom, I'm going to run across cancer or run across Canada to raise money for cancer research. And mom said, no, you aren't. And Terry said, yes, I am. And once Terry got something in his head, you it was a waste of time to try and change his mind. He said, why don't you just run across British Columbia, which is a province? And he said, people get cancer all across Canada. So I'm going to run across Canada, which, by the way, was 5,300 miles. Uh, and he made it 3,339 before he had to stop. He dreamt of doing that since I guess he he, he had gotten cancer then or lost his leg. Yes. And, and by the way, he didn't just get up one morning and say, I'm going to run across Canada. He ran 3000 miles training. Wow. Uh, he, he took two years uh, training. He started by literally running up and down his driveway. He'd fall down. He'd pick himself up. Then he started going up and down the small street that he lived on, then over to the high school track. Week. And then he had this one route that was 20 miles every day. And uh, by 
uh, about eight months after his ampute amputation, he was doing 20 miles a day, um, building up the strength to be able to do it. And uh, as I say, even to this day, 43 years later, it, it amazes me the, the, the determination of that young man. It, it was unbelievable. That, that's incredible. So you wrote your book. So why release the book now? In 19, or I'm sorry, 20, 2015, the Museum of History in uh, Ottawa, the, the capital of Canada, had a year-long display called Running into the Heart of Canada, and it was about Terry. And the curator of that uh, interviewed everybody who was alive at the time. And now today, there's very few people that were closely involved with the runner who are still with us. And at the end of it, he said, you got to write a book because you're the only guy who remembers everything. I can't, I don't remember where my car keys are, but I can tell you exactly what happened 43 years ago. And um, I, I, I tried writing a chapter once and I, I'm a storyteller. I'm not a writer. And um uh, I tried writing a chapter about five years ago. And then another friend of mine who was in the newspaper business, the, the gentleman from the museum was Sheldon Posen. And I, my friend was Ian Harvey. Both of them started last year separately, not even knowing they're doing it, saying, how's the book coming? You have to write that book. And finally, my wife, Sherry, sat me down and said, write the damn book. You owe it to people to tell the story. You owe it to tell the story about who Terry Fox was as a human being. Because over the years, and even during the run, he was perceived as a hero. He's, he's considered Canada's greatest hero. Um, and so I, I gave it a shot. I, I started last summer. Uh, it took me uh, almost a year to write it. Um, it was very emotional having to relive it. And um, at one point, I'm four chapters in, and I call the guy I'm working with and said, this, is not, this isn't working. This is garbage. And he, I said, I keep trying to edit. And he said, stop editing. Just keep writing. It was the best advice I got. And then it just seemed to flow out. Just like the, if you read the book, it's like I'm talking to you. It's like I'm telling you the story. And it's a very easy read. It's a very emotional read. People say on one page, I'm laughing because he had a great sense of humor. And on the next page, I'm crying because there were so many emotional things happened along the way. And uh, there are two generations. There are many new Canadians who have come into our country over the past years. And they know Terry Fox is a hero, but they don't know Terry Fox is the human being. And that was my goal to share my knowledge of my friend. So how long did it take you to, to actually write the book? Well, I started in July of last year, and it was very funny because it, 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 I think by the time, I think I, I got to March, and uh, I said, I'm finished, and my wife popped a bottle of champagne, and we sent the book off, and then it came back and said, now you have to edit it. Oh, okay, I guess we opened the <laughs> champagne too soon. <laughs> uh, so that took another three months. And it literally today is, uh, we're recording this um, August the 30th, and it, it actually hit the bookstores yesterday, mm -hmm. although you can order it online. And it's been, actually it came up on Target and Amazon in the United States before it came available in Canada. So you can order it online in the U.S., and then next month, it comes out in uh, England, New Zealand, and Australia. Very cool. That is very, very cool. Um, so what now, as a as a person, so you got to talk to him a lot then during his short life then. Uh, I, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, what, as a person, what what was he like to talk to? As far as the run was going, um, that first meeting I had with him for two or three days out east, I found out what his schedule was, what his routine was, and I already knew that if you had an idea, you could present it to him, but if he didn't agree with it, it was a waste of time to try and convince him to do something. <laughs> uh, he was supposed to show up for medical treatments in every province. He didn't do it. Um, 
I was sent down by the Cancer Society at that first meeting to lower the boom and say, you know, you have to. Well, I knew, I knew his mom and dad had been down there. They couldn't talk him into it. So I didn't even bring up the subject because I thought, well, if mom and dad can't talk him into it, I'm not going to be able to. Uh, what a lot of people will find in the book, he was he was a, came from a, a, a lovely family. Uh, his dad was a, an engineer on the railroad. His mom managed a card store. Um, he was just a regular kid uh, with an incredible uh, sense of purpose. But what people are going to find out that he had a very funny sense, very dry wit and quick. And I give you an example. My favorite story is Standard Brands, who was Bobby Orr. Bobby Orr was his hero, uh, the Boston uh, hockey player. Mm -hmm. Well, we had lunch with Bobby Orr at Four Seasons. Four Seasons had become a big sponsor by that time, the hotel chain. And uh, anyway, Bobby's, and I'm sure Bobby Orr did not know this was hap this happened, but Standard Brands was their corporate sponsor. And I get a message from the head office, and they said, uh, Standard Brands, and by the way, Planter Peanuts was their product. And they're, uh, if you know Planter's Peanuts, their mascot is Mr. Peanut, who wore the top hat. Wears, it's still around. Wears the top hat, monocle, and the cane, and the tuxedo. So I go to Terry, side of the road, basically, where we did most of our conversations. I went, uh, there's a company that's going to give you a brand new car. If you'll let Mr. Peanut run the last mile of your marathon as you uh, into the Pacific Ocean in Vancouver. And Terry always had this great sly smile and he sh he's shaking his head and he's thinking and he turns to me and he said, you know, Bill, that's a great idea. Let's go with it as long as I can wear the Mr. Peanut outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Which was his very polite way of telling the people where to go. Yeah. Another funny story. We th we think he, when he's in Northern Ontario, we think he's broken his ankle. He thinks he's broken an ankle. It's It's very, very painful. And we have to fly him back 300 miles to the closest town to be diagnosed and it turns out the x-rays is just severe shin splints and the doctor says you have to stay off your feet for a week well that was never going to happen <laughs> and the, the only way we were able to keep him off for two days is we lied to him and told him we had missed the bus to go back up north <laughs> the bus <laughs> came through like every four hours but anyway <laughs> he goes to the hospital he gets x-rayed and they walk out and there's a bunch of media of course by this time he's big news in canada so as he walks out of the hospital there's a bunch of media waiting for him and one genius yells to him terry which one of your ankles is bothering you <laughs> and terry stopped looked at the guy and went the one i don't have <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect oh my gosh that's like the perfect response <laughs> yeah uh, so yeah yeah that's you know talking with terry but by the way during the run and i and if you're a runner you know uh, you don't talk to him. Uh, you, he's, he, he has to concentrate. Yeah. He's got to keep perfect concentration, not just in running, doing the running, but making sure that that, that artificial leg is flipping through. Because a couple of times he tripped and fell flat on his face. Oh. Uh, so the only time you talk to him is if he talked to you. Uh, we had good days. We had bad days. Some days he was very light. Everything was going great. And, and we'd end up um, also the uh, there was a movie that was made for HBO back in 1982. And actually, Robert Duvall plays me in the movie. But it portrayed Terry as an angry man who was angry at cancer, angry at the world. He was not any sense of that word. Uh, he was he was off. He said, I may be a dreamer, but I have to dream. Because I want to find a cure for cancer, and I may not find it, but I got to try. And so there was often times where, uh, yeah, he got mad at us, but it's usually at the team, and it was usually because we weren't paying attention. On, on one instance, he shows up and uh, for his uh, break for water and oranges, and we're in the middle of a water fight with the policemen who were escorting us and Daryl and. <laughs> And of course, he starts yelling at us, very angry. Where's my water? You guys only got one job to do. 
But 30 seconds later, he's in the middle of the water fight. <laughs> so, so there were days that were light like that. But if you're a runner, you know, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want your concentration interrupted by uh, silliness. Yeah. And, and, and he never, I have to tell you one story. He never stopped, you know, cause people, we only stopped every, he would stop for a, a water break every two miles and uh, people, and he would have short chats with people, but as long as the run, I never knew him to actually stop in the middle of running, except for one day. And we were going through a large city and we're a very busy intersection. And all of a sudden I can hear this voice and it's a woman yelling at the top of her lungs. And she's yelling, stop it, stop it. And she's yelling at Terry, they're using you, they're using you. And and then I, I looked around and we were in the middle of the intersection and, and what she, I very quickly realized what she was thinking was, is that the Canadian Cancer Society was making him do this run and making him push himself. And he stopped. He went over to the car very nicely, very politely said to the woman, they're not using me enough and turned around and started running again. In retrospect, you know, although I found it upsetting at the time, in retrospect, that woman could have been thinking of him as her own son. Mm -hmm. And there were many people along the road that tr tried to convince him to stop. Uh, the war amputees, for instance, said they were, he was damaging his, his himself by doing it. He wasn't going to stop for anybody. There was nothing going to stop him from that run. And I thought to myself, you know, as a parent many years later, I probably I wouldn't have done that, but I probably understand why she felt that way. Yeah. What, I mean, what, what further damage? I mean, <laughs> in retrospect, it was, it was all his heart and his soul, his passion was in that run. If you take that away from him, he, what, what else would, would he have is what he's thinking probably. That, that was his purpose you know, yeah. for being, that's what yeah. it became. He, he lost a leg mm -hmm. and he found a cause mm -hmm. and he was not a martyr. He didn't mm -hmm. go out there to kill himself. No. He went out there and he was, he, and, and, and again, once again, runners, how did he do it? He ran telephone to telephone post, to telephone post. He said, I can't run a marathon a day, but I can run to that telephone pole and I can run to the next telephone pole. And that's how he was able to do it. And, and in the back of his mind all the time, like he, this guy sounded like when, even when I met him, he was like, this, this kid's too good to be true. Like, I'm, now I never felt that way, but a lot of people at the beginning and even during the run, we would have reporters show up trying to find something, a crack in this guy. And everybody walked away and went, no, he's, he's, he's the real deal. He's coming from, he's coming from deep inside his heart and soul. You know, the telephone pole thing is very important because I always tell beginning runners, don't think of the whole race. Think of it from like one telephone pole to telephone pole or from one block to one block. Just divide up the race to small little segments. And once you finish one segment, then you finish the next segment. And that that way the race gets a lot easier. Don't think of the whole race because it can be overwhelming and you might not, you might stop if you think of it in the entirety like that. Exactly. And that's how he was able to do it every day. He he broke it down and he was very meticulous on um, making sure that he ran every step of the way in the morning when he pulled up to where he finished the night before. If we were in the country, we'd, we would bury a plastic shopping bag and the gravel on the side of the road. And Doug, his driver, would have to pull up so that he opened the door and stepped on that bag. And if we were in an urban area, he would go over and touch a telephone pole, a fire hydrant, something. And the next morning, he would go over and touch that same pole. Um, he did not want anybody to ever say he didn't run every single step of the way. That just shows his character. It certainly does. Would you have ever guessed the impact that the Marathon of Hope would have on the money raised for cancer in Canada? I I knew it was going even during the run by the time we hit Toronto and passed that 
it had become a big national story uh, across Canada. Over time, it's become a worldwide story. There are there's runs around the world. I think there's one in Santa Monica. I was looking up yesterday. Um, I a few years ago, my son teaches in China, and I went to visit him. And his school was going to go to a run in another city, and so my son was sick. And he said, "Will you go with the kids?" And I went with the kids. And the run started on a very high-end golf course in a city called Guangzhou, which is a, somewhat of a westernized city. But it started on the driving range. And I was asked to say a few words. And on the top was the governor of the province, the mayor of a, a city of 8 million people, um, all kinds of successful big businessmen. And I'm looking out at 8,000 high school students wearing the same t-shirt that they were wearing in Canada that year. And the only difference was the lettering was all in Chinese. And I can remember standing up there and thinking, talking, because I talked to Terry in my head a lot over the years. I can remember having a conversation with him. You'd never believe what your run became. In Cuba, um, I don't know if it's still running, but three million people used to go out uh, every year to do the Terry Fox run. And it wasn't an organized run. The national radio station on a Sunday, they ring a buzzer or something and say, it's time to go. And people would just come out of their houses and start running. And my wife was there a few years ago and, and handing out some souvenirs with Terry to Terry and talking to school kids and people about Terry. And she asked them why how did Cuba of all countries become such a, a big follower of Terry Fox? And she was told that back then cancer was the word cancer was not spoken. You were almost the leper um, in that, in, in that uh, area. And when Terry started running down the road, wearing a pair of shorts, nobody ran. First off, not even running. No, and again, back those days, I don't ever remember anybody walking around with a pair of shorts with one leg. It, it's, it was the kind of you wore long pants. And they said that image of him when those shorts, and by the way, they were short shorts. And my, <laughs> my, my kid, I used to, I had the same shorts. Kids wear, those are short shorts, Dad. They are not. <laughs> But he changed the entire culture in, in the country of Cuba. Um, there's a big, a giant run, I think 20,000 people in, in uh, Saudi Arabia do the Terry Fox run. There's uh, uh, two new ones in London, England this year, too, as well. So his, his story has gone around the world, and it's a story of hope. Um, it's a story of community involvement. It's a story of being the best you can. And when he got sick and he had to quit, he said, I'm not disappointed. I know that I did everything I possibly could. And uh, he had, used to say early in the run, which made me think over the years, I think he knew the cancer was returning before he told anybody else. Because there were a couple of very emotional, dramatic speeches he made in the Toronto area where he said, if I can't finish the run, the marathon of hope has to keep going and people have to step up and finish my run for me. Mm. And 43 years later, they're still running and there's been massive uh, progress. Uh, I, I just want to address cancer quickly. It's not just one disease. It's many different kinds of diseases. So when people say, we still got cancer, well, there's been massive advances and uh, that a lot of it to do with the $850 million he's raised over the years is probably going to reach a billion next year. Um, prostate cancer, breast cancer, childhood brain cancer, um, uh, uh, leukemia, some of these cancers, they've made great progress in the, in the quality of life and the lengths of people living. Other ones, they're, they're not having. But um, he said, as I said before, uh, I have to dream. I'm a dreamer because I have to be. Yeah, yeah, you have to be, and we've made such great strides in since Terry's 
Terry has been on, on the earth, we have just made some phenomenal strides in, in cancer research. Do you think you would have been, had become a publicist uh, if you had not met Terry? Well, that was the, the advantage. That's why I was, that's why I served him. Um, one of the nurses that I spoke about earlier, uh, I had a book signing before I, I, I came east on this tour. And she wrote me this lovely letter. And the essence of it was people came into Terry's life at the right time who had the right expertise or background or talents to be able to help him on his journey. And that was from the police. And once he hit Ontario, he had a, a provincial police escort. Uh, Basically, every officer I've ever talked to them told me that, that whether it was four hours or a day or five days with Terry changed their lives. Um, that uh, So my background actually was I was in radio when I was 17. Mm, um, okay. I, I, I came from small town, but I was at 17. I was, you know, learned, becoming a news guy on the radio. Uh, 22, I was elected as a chamber, as a city council member. And my, I was a shit disturber when I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> and when I, and when I get elected to council, I think, oh well, you can fool some of the people some of the time. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess I fooled enough. <laughs> and and in high school, I was running dances, so I was a, 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 I was a people person. I was a promoter, and my mom and dad raised uh, us, uh, our family as. Everybody was equal. It doesn't matter with the color of your skin, your religion. Um, um, you know, I had a friend who lost a leg being running over by a train uh, when I was 12. Mm. Um, so it, to deal with an amputee, to me, from the beginning, wasn't odd. And uh, also, I was an Irish background. So uh, I don't know if you know anything about Irish and, mm. and wakes. You know, when I was growing up, Funerals were parties, <laughs> you know. The, you know the everybody and the, the, the relatives they all passed away at a like, nice old age in late eighties and nineties, and so everybody would come from all across the country for the party. And when you're twelve years old, it's a, it's oh sorry, Uncle George died, but do you know how much money I made running up for cigarettes? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's my dad's side of the family. <laughs> yeah. So I had a, a different approach on it. So I was able to use that skill or that talent to when I first met him to go, OK, this guy's going to be big when he gets into a populated area, because uh, like the United States, the eastern part of you know Maine, there's a lot of rural area. And that was what he was in on, on the east coast of Canada. And I saw how he affected people. And I thought when he gets in a populated area, this is going to explode simply because when he spoke and when, when you see any of the documentaries about Terry, everything came from the heart. Um, you could be in a room with 500 of the biggest uh, business executives in Canada, which happened. And before it, he was very nervous. And he said, what do I say? And I said, they're no different than the people in the town center you spoke to yesterday, just tell them your story. Yeah. And yeah. when he spoke, and it was 500 of the business biggest business leaders in Canada that had come together, uh, and you could have heard a pin drop in that room. And he was very nervously, he had a paper clip in his hand. And if you ever see the speech, all you can hear is this click sound. Mm -hmm. And what he's doing, he's clicking it with his finger. And that's the, other than his voice, that's the only sound you can hear in this room for about 15 minutes while he talks. Uh, a, a, his, his message resonated. Uh, and 43 years later, if somebody picks up that documentary and watches it, I guarantee you uh, two things. You're going to have a great admiration for a young man. You're going to like him a lot because he was a very likable person. And you're going to get very emotional. Yeah. Uh, yeah. it's an emotional story that was one of the hardest things about writing the book yeah. Yeah. i can imagine it it's a wonderful book and i know that 
uh, the listeners are going to really enjoy it. Uh, there will be links for for you all to purchase it on the website, MarthaRunsTheWorld.com. And we'll have all of uh, Bill's links on the website as well. And thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Martha. And it was great, you know, it was great for me to talk because usually I'm just, I'm doing all these interviews, but to talk about the running aspect of Terry, yeah. I know that he would like this. And, I, and I'm just going to leave you with one last story. Mm-hmm. When he got sick and went home, there was this explosion of love across the country where they were naming streets after him or recreation centers. He was a very humble person and uh, he was appreciative, but at the same time, he did not like the moniker as a hero, but when he was named, um, he got the Lou Marsh Canadian athlete of the year award. And he called me at home, and that was the one thing that he was excited about, because he perceived his run, not just running for cancer, but as an athletic feat. And that was important for him to be recognized for that. Yeah, yeah. I I know that that he, all his whole life, I know he worked hard to try to be the best athlete that he could. So I know that was super important. Um, Well, he will always be in our hearts. And he was one of the the inspirations for me to get started running when I was young. And I'll truly appreciate him. And I appreciate all the work that went into the book. And best of luck on on, on you and all the adventures that you get into and your book. And thank you so much. Thank you very much, Martha. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate you being on the show. It was delightful talking to you. The book is amazing, and I know that Martha Runs the World listeners will love it. I appreciate it very much, and just in I will always be in awe of what Terry accomplished for all, for cancer, for runners, for Canada, for everyone around the world. He really gave the world hope. And he continues to do so. And I know your work with him was amazing. And I'll have a link that you can buy Terry and me on the website, MarthaRunsTheWorld.com. Sorry. (laughs) Oh, boy, it's been a long, long day. All right. But you'll be able to uh, buy that there and read it for yourself. And I hope you do. All right. That is today's show. And I hope you had a wonderful running week. Mine was pretty good. Not too bad. And um, this next weekend I have off, so I'll get a long run in, much longer than four or six miles, that's for sure. And I will tell you all about next week. And it will be another great show. So everything that you want is on the website. If you want to become a subscriber of Martha Runs the World, you can do so right on the website. It'll say, there's a little link that says support the show. You can do it for $3 a month. That's all. Three bucks a month. And as soon as I get the first subscriber, I will start posting extra episodes. I know I don't have one yet, but I just started it. So as soon as I get that, I'm going to start posting extra episodes and you'll hear all about them. I'll probably put one episode a month. If I get a ton of new subscribers, I'll probably do it twice a month. All right, so you know the website, MarthaRunsTheWorld.com, and my email is MarthaRunsTheWorld at gmail.com. So until next week, let's tie up our shoelaces and go for a run.